Good morning. Today I want to share with you about faith that pleases God. Why do I talk about faith that pleases God? Because there is faith that does not please him. The question is not whether somebody has faith. Every person on this earth has faith. They have faith in something, in somebody. But for the believers, the true believers, the true disciples of Jesus, their faith is in Jesus Christ. Their faith is in the God, the true God who created the heavens and the earth. Their faith is in his word that he has given to his people. So this morning, I want to encourage you to have faith that pleases God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. What pleases him? There's so many things that please him. We see that in his word. The things that, you know, that he has declared his commendations on, that bless his heart. But faith exceptionally pleases God. You know, Jesus asked this question in Luke 18, 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And I believe that this is a prophetic reminder again to us. I believe the Lord is asking us again, my son and my daughter, as I come back, will you be in faith? Will the posture of your heart be directed towards me? looking to me, believing my word, doing what I commanded you to do. And like I mentioned, the question is never or not whether we have faith. So I've put forth some questions in order to help us think, beloved. It's important that we do. All good believers, all true disciples are men and women of good and deep thought. Think about this as I ask, what do you have your faith in? What is the anchor or foundation or focus of your life? What inspires you? From whom or what do you draw your strength daily and especially in difficult times? On what basis do you make your daily or important life decisions? Whom or who or what do you turn to first in a time of crisis? And I want to request you as I, as I move ahead to think about these things and be honest with yourself as to who your faith is directed towards. So I want to share with you three things about faith. Faith that pleases God. Number one, faith that pleases God is faith that looks to God. It's a heart that has resolved to posture itself and position itself to look to him no matter what. And we go through different things in life, beloved. You know, there are good days. And things seem to be going our way and there are bad days. There are difficult times, more than just days. There are difficult seasons. Or there could even be a lifelong challenge that you have to live with. And your faith will be put to the test in order to prove that it is more precious than gold. Just as gold is refined in the furnace of fire, in the same way, faith is purified in the furnace of trials and testings. And it is at these, these times that our Faith gets purified and more deeply rooted and founded. And we're able to remove the impurities of distractions on being dependent on other people and dependent on other things and selfish ambitions. You know, we get purified of ungodly desires, ungodly and wrong motives, wrong attitudes, and our faith is purified. Not just our faith, but our entire life, our entire being is sanctified. And so no trial or no testing is to be wasted. 
because God uses anything and everything that comes our way because there's nothing that comes our way that is not according to his will and his purpose for our life. Even if he has not ordained it, if he has allowed it in his sovereignty, we must trust him. And God can even use the foolish things that we bring upon ourselves in order to make us wiser. Now I want to take us to a story in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. And this is the story of David at Ziklag. It's an interesting story. I've just mentioned it a couple of months back. So I don't want to repeat all of the details, but for our remembrance, you know, David and his men, after many months or probably after a few years of just being like nomad, nomadic warriors or tribal warriors, finally were able to settle down in a city that they were gifted called Ziklag. And so here were these men with their families, with their wives, children, loved ones, parents, elderly parents, settled down into this beautiful city of Ziklag. And can you imagine the horror one day after a military expedition when David and his men were riding back towards Ziklag, and from a far distance they see that the city is on fire. And as they rush in, they come to know and understand that the entire city has been burned down and the wives and the children and all their loved ones have been taken away captive by a, 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 a people called as the Amalekites. The Amalekites were distant relatives of the Israelites. And God had commanded for them to be annihilated because one of their sins, which were debaucherous, they were, they were an absolutely wicked and a filthy and an immoral um, people group. But further to that, also they troubled the Israelites. When the Israelites were in the wilderness coming out of Egypt, the Amalekites would keep coming at the back and attacking them at the rear end. And you, you know, when there's, there's a trail or a train of thousands of people, who's at the back end? It's the people who are the weakest, the sickly, the elderly, maybe even the children. And the Amalekites would come at the back and attack the Israelites and plunder. And God had therefore commanded because of their sins and their wickedness and what they did to the Israelites, annihilated them. And this is the same Amalekites who do the same thing here now. Ziklag is undefended. It's only the women, the children, the elderly parents probably who are there. The men are away. And the Amalekites come, burn the city, you know, destroy it and take all of the women and children, and the ones who are left behind as captive. And when David and his men come back, you're faced with this horrendous, this horrific sight. But what increased the pain and the distress of David was when he heard his own men speak of stoning him because they felt that he was responsible for what had happened. And they were just so themselves heartbroken. What would David do at such a time? See, beloved, we cannot see ahead. Today, when we read that account, we know that, you know, after this test, and after this very painful time, David was actually catapulted to become the king of Judah and eventually the whole of Israel. But David didn't know that at that time. David could only see a city burned down and his loved ones and his men in such pain because their families are not there. And they're trying to figure out who's done this. And that's when faith is put to the test. You know, beloved, suffering reveals it all. It's not our claims. It's not what we say. It's not the songs that we sing. Merely. Songs are important. You know, songs become precious. Songs become beautiful when they come from a pure faith. A faith that has gone through it all and is prepared to go through it all, no matter what happens, because it's a faith that comes from a heart that is resolved, that is resolved that is purposed in its, you know, as, as it says about Daniel, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself, that he would not compromise, that he would not give up. Beloved, we are weak people, but by the grace of God, we can fight the good fight of faith in order to keep the posture of our heart positioned towards God, no matter what we go through, no matter what we gain, no matter what we lose. And here's David. You know, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6 helps us understand what he was going through. 
but it ends that verse six with something very, very important for us. I'll read it for you. First Samuel chapter 30, verse six, it says, also David was in great distress because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David felt strengthened in the Lord his God. Beloved, that is important. Now, there are different translations giving us two different perspectives. One translation, as I read from the NASB, it says, David felt strengthened in the Lord his God. Another translation says, and David strengthened himself in the Lord. Both are true. Because God supplies his strength, therefore we can strengthen ourselves. We cannot strengthen ourselves in ourselves. For we have no strength in ourselves. The reason we can strengthen ourselves in the Lord is because it is the Lord who gives us his strength. Especially in times like this. And David did just that. That's faith. That pleases God. That appropriates his grace. Receives of his strength. And strengthens himself and says, God, I look to you. I call upon you. I exalt you right now. I turn my heart and my thoughts and my emotions towards you. And I believe that you will show me the way through this and out of this. My brothers and sisters, God has a plan for your life. And I just don't say that casually. You know, as a million times you hear, you have heard this. It's important to hear that another million times because it is true. A couple of nights back, I was listening to a dear old pastor. And while listening to the video message, he said this beautifully again. God has a plan for your life. But beloved, I'm not here to hint that God wants to make you a king like David. It's not important. What, are, what is going to be our earthly positions, offices are of secondary importance. Because whatever we have, whatever we receive is to fulfill God's primary mandate and purpose on the earth. And that is to save lost souls and make disciples. Beloved, let's be clear on that. That this is not about us. So God, God's plan for our life is inseparably connected with his global mission to save the lost. So his plan may take you places. His plan will open unusual doors of opportunity for you to do his will, to fulfill his purpose. It may position you in places and pathways that will help you see the power and glory of God. You know, when we see God doing amazing things as recorded in the Bible, it was not to build the ministries of the individuals, you know, through whom he did it, to give them a high and make them a celebrity. This was not about Moses becoming a celebrity, building a ministries, www.mosesministries.com. This was not about what we see a lot in Christendom today. This was not about, about them. And let me make myself absolutely clear, beloved. If you have a fantasy right now that this is about you, it's, it's good that you get out of that fantasy as quickly as possible. Do yourself a favor. Because the eternal reality is this, that this is all about the glory of God. And when you connect with that, your joy and your cup will overflow. So it is the joy of seeing the Lord to do his work in and through us to transform the lives of people by his gospel. So when you are in this God-focused, mission-focused path, as David was, a ziklag may happen to you. You may lose it all for some time, or you may lose some precious things for the rest of your time on the earth. What are you going to do? Do what David did. What did he do? He strengthened himself in the Lord. How does one do that? You know, thank God that some of the most important truths are simple. As a man and a woman of faith, Remind yourself of the love of God demonstrated for you on the cross. Remind yourself of the price that was paid for the redemption of your soul 
for the salvation of your soul, to help you receive forgiveness for your sins, to give you eternal and new life. Remind yourself. Remind yourself that you're a blood-bought child sealed by the Holy Spirit. Remind yourself that the Holy Spirit indwells you. Remind yourself of the beautiful and powerful thing that God has done for you in the past. You should have a fallback. Some things to fall back on. Remind yourself. Remind yourself of his goodness, his faithfulness to you thus, thus far. Ebenezer is his name. The Lord has helped us thus far. And therefore, that becomes the foundation of what he is going to do. Remind yourself of the promises and prophecies over your life. And I want to say this, even if you do a ziklag to your own self, that means you fall into sin, you do some, you've done something so stupid and foolish, and you've burnt your own self down, what God gifted you or has built through you, the only right thing at that time to do is to be able to call on the Lord who is gracious, is slow to anger, is abounding in mercy. When you don't know what to do, there is one thing that you should do that you will never be wrong in doing. That is to call upon the name of the Lord. To turn to Him. Look to Him. Praise Him. Pray to Him. Pour out your heart to Him. And that is faith that pleases God. That has postured and positioned itself to look to Him no matter what. Whether you are in a palace in Jerusalem, figuratively, or whether you're standing in front of the ruins of your ziklag, faith looks to God. Because it's not about us, it's about Him. Number two, faith receives the word of God and contends with the facts. I want to make this quick. And this is about Abraham receiving the promise of a son, Isaac. So faith receives the word of God and contends with the fact. Faith does not negate the facts or deny the facts. Faith takes into consideration the facts and exalts the word of God over it. Faith says that, yes, this is the reality, but God can bypass this. God can do beyond this. So I'm just going to read this passage, which will explain it for itself. Beautiful. Romans chapter 4, 16 to 25. I'm going to read the entire passage. Stay with me as I read it and listen carefully, beloved, the engineering of faith, how faith works. Because faith is faith when it works. Verse 16, for this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. So that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. That is God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that do not exist. In hope, against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Verse 19 is important from here. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. How? Giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to, to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our wrongdoings and was raised because of our justification. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, Faith does not deny the facts. Here was Abraham's body as good as dead. But God had given him a promise. And Abraham made the good choice to hold on to that promise as it is recorded here 
without wavering in unbelief. You must hold on, beloved. How do you hold on? Hold on in any and every way possible. Read it, reread it, think about it, confess it, repeat it in your prayers, repeat it in your praises, in your declarations. What God has promised, he will bring it to pass. 25 years it took from the time that the word came first to Abraham, the promise came, that I will give you a son. To the actual fulfillment of it was 25 years. You know, one can actually talk about what those 25 years could have been like for Abraham. But for those 25 years, though Abraham did a very wrong thing and he moved away, God lovingly brought him back because God is faithful. And so my dear brothers and sisters, our faith is not in ourselves, in our ability, in our consistency, but in him who has promised that he is able to do it. Has God spoken to you about your family, the salvation of your family, of your loved ones, of what God can do through you, through your family? Then, Beloved, hold on to it. Be active in your prayers, in your praise. Be active in the way you are doing things in order to see that your family comes into the faith, that they'll come to know the Lord. Don't give up. Has God spoken to you some things about your career, about your work, about the ministry? Then don't give up. Has God spoken some things about your health? Don't give up. Don't deny the facts. Acknowledge the facts. In fact, that's what gives glory to God because the facts are this, but God is able to do beyond that. The third thing that I want to share, beloved, is faith exalts God. So the first thing I shared was faith that pleases God is faith that looks to God. Secondly, faith that pleases God is a faith that receives the word of God and contends with the facts. The third, faith that pleases God is faith that exalts God. You know, some of us, you know, we exalt our problems. The moment we get into a conversation, you should hear yourself. Or in the moment you're in a crisis or in a sort of a negative situation, hear yourself. Oh, I don't know. I don't think. I'm, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't. And the, the I don't is more than what you know. There's so much of unbelief. And beloved, it's time we call the axe, the axe, the spade, the spade. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Some of us need a major overhaul. And what is that overhaul? We need to get back to God. Because you've been all over the place, except where you need to be. You run here, you go there, you want appreciation from people, you want appreciation from this one, you want that one to acknowledge you, you want that one to commend you, and you're not realizing that you need to be in the place where you need to hear the most important commendation and affirmation over your life, and that is from the Lord himself. You'll be a very disturbed person, beloved, if you don't position yourself where you need to be. And that position is in the place of faith. Faith exalts God. And the three things I want to mention in this, because it exalts his grace. As we just read in Romans 4, verse 16, for this reason it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. Everything that God gives us, is because of his grace. Everything that he has for us, we can receive it only by grace through faith. And therefore, it is by faith, the Apostle Paul writes, in order that it may be in accordance with grace. So faith exalts the grace of God. I didn't do it. I couldn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. Firstly, I didn't deserve it. Then I couldn't earn it could only believe and he gave it to me and he's given me from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace through faith so faith that pleases God is faith that exalts his grace secondly it exalts his word Romans 10 17 says that so when we believe God we believe his word what he has said God, you said it. This is what the facts are. This is what the reality is around. But God, this is what you've said. And I believe you. I believe your word. 
Number three, it exalts the gospel. Faith exalts the gospel because God relates to us, gives us everything only by grace through faith. And this is possible only through believing the gospel. All that we are, all that we have, all that we will have is only because of the finished work of Jesus at the cross. And so, beloved, faith exalts the gospel because there is no other basis by which we can come, we can receive, we have, and we can be everything in God except through the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. And so faith will take us there, right there. It exalts the gospel, it exalts his grace, it exalts his faith. It's his word. And so my brothers and sisters, this morning, this is a prophetic reminder for us. When the Son of Man comes back on earth, will he find faith? But what kind of faith? Not faith in other people, faith in circumstances. I hope this works out. Faith in our money, surely not, not in our, in our qualifications. Faith in God. God uses all of those things in order to fulfill his purpose. They're not bad things. I don't mean to picture them as bad, but they become bad when we begin to make them the basis and the foundation of our life and our decisions or the basis of our value and worth. Absolutely not. That's ridiculous. It is who God is. It's what he has done for us and what he's doing in us is the basis of our worth, our value, who we are and who we are going to be and where we're headed. So my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to have this kind of faith that pleases him. Faith that looks to God no matter what we go through. Whether we are in a palace in Jerusalem, as I said, figuratively, or in front of burned down ruins of a ziklag in our life. Number two is a faith that believes his word and contends with the facts. Number three is a faith that exalts God, not your circumstances not your situations, not what people are saying, not what people have done or not done. It's a faith that exalts God because it exalts his gospel, it exalts his grace, it exalts his word. May the Lord bless you. I believe that God will help us to be men and women full of faith, and full of the Holy Spirit. And we will do great things for God, not because it's about ourselves, but it, this is all about his glory and glory alone. The Lord bless you and your precious family have a faith-filled week and may you keep growing in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Mm -hmm.